Don't ever feel that your love for games and your passion for games is a problem. Don't ever let anyone make you feel that way. Always articulate what is positive and wonderful about playing games. Just remember, we as humans have been playing games for thousands of years. Hopefully we will for thousands more. My name is John Festinger, and uh, I was um, and remain a lawyer, called to the bar in 1981, went to McGill Law before that. And I started out as a media and communications lawyer, uh, primarily acting for newsrooms. I, I really did a lot of freedom of expression work, and that's probably the bright red line through my career, uh, the common denominator. Moving from broadcasting um, to uh, digital media and video games might at first not seem that intuitive, but um, it was really a very natural progression. Uh, when I started doing work for media clients in the early 80s, um, sort of the best and brightest kids were just then moving from radio to TV. And then I noticed uh, kind of in the late 1990s, early turn of the millennium, that something very similar was happening. Now it was people moving from television into, into video games. So the, sort of the nature of mass media was changing. And I guess I've always been interested in popular culture. So I just kind of naturally moved with it. And I was a, a gamer from the first game of Pong that was uh, in the local bowling alley when I was in high school. So uh, I come by it honestly. When I really got into online gaming was in uh, the late 90s, and it was a game called Grand Prix Legends. And Grand Prix Legends was a uh, groundbreaking game in terms of uh, the physics of a racing game. It was the first game that moved from an imaginary central pivot point to the physics being the four wheels of the car. Um, it used up a lot of CPU. It required um, a, a racing wheel and pedals, which wasn't very prevalent in 1997. Um, the online didn't work very well. Um, and it had a whole bunch of issues. It, it was released in a relatively unfinished state, but it, had, but it was groundbreaking in its own way. It didn't do very well. It was reviewed rather poorly. It was released by Papyrus because it was in an unfinished state. What was really interesting was that the, a community grew around the game. And the community not only fixed the game, it built on the game. It made multiplayer work, um, and it became an amazing community um, to be part of. And um, so I got to see firsthand in how community and developer and gamers all kind of work together. And because it was such a special game, um, it, it, it was really very magical. You know, the, the argument's always the same. Video games cause harm, uh, and the courts say, okay, uh, if it causes harm, we may deal with it, but we need evidence of direct harm. Uh, and we need to see how violent video games actually create violence, and then the connection and the nexus is not found, and the courts say, well, we're not gonna treat video games any differently than we treat movies or books. Yet, every couple of years, we have a new sensorial attempt by some state body, and they always fail. So, you know, censorship is a bad thing, but the courts have been good to video games over the years, and very clear, and there haven't been decisions going uh, the other way. There's no question that our charter has uh, freedom of expression in it, and freedom of expression includes video games, and likewise the notion of freedom of speech in the United States. Every time a new medium comes up, and it doesn't matter if it's uh, magazines from newspapers, or radio, or television, or video games, whenever a new medium comes up, the censors come out of the woodwork. 
you know, when you look back now and you look back at uh, Elvis Presley being censored below the waist, uh, the Ed Sullivan show, um, that seems pretty silly. Um, you know, the Like a Virgin controversy over Madonna's song uh, 25 years ago. When you look back at it, it looks silly. A lot of censorship looks really, really silly. But every new medium experiences it. Criticism of games um, is is fine, it's fair, it's part of the public debate. And so there are academic criticisms, there are social criticisms, there are legitimate concerns about violence in children, there's le legitimate concerns about sexism in games. All of those things are healthy things to debate in a free and democratic society, and I think we should have more of it, not less of it. But in terms of creating legislation, um, you know, I don't want to say that it's not uh, possible that one day a direct link will be found, but it really hasn't been. And if I was going to be concerned about a social issue, I'd be a lot more concerned about long-term damage to children uh, arising from concussions because of playing high school football than I would be about high schoolers playing video games. Video game law is at the cutting edge of all digital media law. Um, uh, academically and intellectually and practically. You know, it sounds like it's a peripheral area or an area that's, you know, just interesting to people who are interested in games. But uh, the reality is that, that um, video games have had a business model associated with them for 30 years now. Uh, and have been financially successful and have had phases of great financial success that has spurred on more creativity and, and more and more video games. Um, so of all the digital media that's out there that is entertainment based, that is mass media based, it's really the only one that's had a long financial background and, uh, of, of success and, uh, and a constant stream of creativity. From that perspective, a lot of the things that we see in digital media that, uh, that create legal interest or that are of legal interest, like um, you know, voice over IP, you know, uh, the legal ramifications of Skype. Well, people were, were doing voice chat and video games long before there was Skype. Um, uh, the notion of community that we see in Facebook and some of these issues. Well, you know, there have been communities around games like Doom and, and, and Grand Prix Legends and Flight Sims for decades now. So the issue of community that we are now facing in the digital world, that's hardly a new issue. It's a very old issue if you look at video games. So video games have been first in so many areas. And the, so the first to deal with the complexities of the law interacting with digital media. It's almost always in a video game context because there's actually success and money at stake that makes it worth having the debate. Putting together the book was uh, a combination of uh, a passion for gaming and, and seeing an area evolve. I was very lucky when, when I was just starting out as a young lawyer, the notion of being a broadcast lawyer didn't really exist. And there were a couple of uh, wonderful people in Toronto, very senior people, uh, a lawyer by the name of John Hilton and a few others, who basically created an area you know, an area of media and communications law that I fell into very easily. And um, when video games came along, I guess in a way I just sort of replicated that process and said, you know, this is an area, it's very different. Digital media is very different from traditional analog media. Um, the law is, uh, and the application of the law is different and is going to be very different. Um, and I guess I have been teaching at, at law school at UBC as an adjunct since 1993. So, uh, uh, you know, my, my academic interest was always there and I decided um, to write a book. And I say in the introduction to the book that I hope uh, that the book will spur on some more academic work in the area. 
Just want to wish the best of luck uh, to basedgamer.com. Um, we need every uh, possible voice uh, where we as, uh, as uh, uh, people who love games uh, can talk to each other and we need every positive articulation of, um, of games uh, to the world at large. The really good news is that everybody's a gamer today, so uh, the audience gets wider and wider and uh, in the, at the end of the day, that's a really, really good thing. Take care.